in that. And a lot of people, occasionally we get outside experts writing it, but most of it is other translators. And it covers all sorts of you know, relevant issues. There are reviews of, of new publications, there are letters, there are, it's, it's a very informative um, document that goes to all members. And if you're a non-member, you can also buy a subscription to it. And in the back it event, it, there's a list of events in the back there which can help you if you're planning. So, yes, I already talked about the mentoring partnerships. We're, we're working on lots of things. We, we're not a very big organisation, but we're very ambitious. And we're, we're developing a strategic plan of all the millions of things we want to do. But um, one of the priorities is to develop CPD. And we're, we're working at the moment on the, this mentoring, which is going to be coming as part of our new um, website. <coughs> it's going to be launched halfway through next year, we think. We hope. This year. This year. Oh, yeah, we're Yes, I'm still behind Christmas. Okay, we're also working on course development with lots of different partners and at lots of different levels, and we'll see how that goes. But um, we want to be able to at least guide our, our members who are further up and more experienced, if, even if we can't provide what they need, at least tell them where to go to find it. But for the bulk of our members, we want to actually produce our own training, which would and we're also looking at approval and accreditation for courses and trainers, because mainly because we're being approached by people who are producing courses and they say, would ITI give us accreditation? So we've got to sort that framework out, we've got the basics. So there's lots going on in ITI for continuing professional development. And that's me, I think. Yes, questions to the end.
I didn't take any courses on translation technology, even though they were offered. Um, so that was something that, that later on I realized might be a good thing. But luckily we had a couple of teachers who were really into their translation technology. So they had in their translation courses, they actually used the CAP tools. So I wanted to use those as well. Then um, in my third year, the first half of my third year in my Erasmus, so I went to Middlesex University in London, where I studied literature, um, audiovisual translation, and uh, interpreting. And then after my fourth year, so in the summer a year before I graduated, I managed to get um, an internship at a um, local, quite large translation agency called Wings of Translations. Um, as a, a well, mainly in just Swedish translators, so I was working on EU texts on public administration. So that's sort of my, that was my foot in the door. So then a year after that, I graduated. And um, originally, when I was still studying, I thought, well, I want, I want to, well, first I wanted to be an interpreter, and then I decided, no, maybe that's not for me, so I'll be a translator, and I'd want an in house job. But then after my internship, I actually realized that maybe. Maybe in-house isn't for me either, so I'll, I'll just go freelance, which makes sense because that's the easiest thing to do as well because there's not a lot of in-house jobs. So originally, to make it easier, it's, it's easier in the UK to set up a business than it is in Finland. So rather than become self-employed, we set up a sort of translation branch in my dad's company, which is a building company, but it was, we just set it up as a, as a branch there. So he could do the admin and I did the, all the translation side of the work. So I did that, and at this point I had a few agency clients. I had Linksoft, which that was that was the lucky thing because I started out already having a big client because of my internship. And then um, I got another agency through a friend who was an intern. This agency, who were looking for someone translating into Swedish, and then um, I applied to a few as well, so I got a third one that way. And I also had a handful of direct clients just randomly through referrals from other translators, from, through word of mouth, just telling everyone and anyone that I'm a translator, hoping that they might spread the word. And then we had a, um, at my university, there was a list that clients could send an email saying we're looking for to have this translated, if you have anyone, and they'd spread it to students and, and see if you find anyone to do it. So I got a few different clients from a few different, different sources. And then, um, things started to go, not, not wrong exactly, but for me, sort of, in my mind. I had, after, um, so I started freelancing full time in the spring of 2013, and in June I moved to Edinburgh, just because I wanted to, there wasn't much, much more of a reason, but I moved to Edinburgh, and then about six months after I started freelancing, I started to get increasingly stressed and worried. I, I was, I felt like I was in, ch in sort of, control of my finances. I thought, what if the work stops coming in? How will I pay the bills? Um, also felt that I didn't have any, that there wasn't any sort of career prospects in the sense that if I had a job, I could just move up the ranks, sort of, whereas if I'm a translator now, five years, ten years from now, I'll still be a translator, and felt that I wouldn't be moving anywhere. Um, so I just started applying for any kind of job because I felt like even if it pays less than what I earn as a translator, at least I know there will be a set amount every single month and someone else will take care of, of um, pensions and everything. So I was very, very stressed at this point. But then I really came to my rescue. Uh, what happened, I met um, another translator who told me about ITI um, and suggested that maybe I should join. And it took me quite a while, but then in the spring of 2004, I thought, okay, I'll finally join. So I joined ITI and I started reading the bulletin. And um, through that, I found out about um, there was a list, I think it was a, a review of a few books. So I looked into these books. The first one was Chris Durbin's The Prosperous Translator. So I read that and I started seeing that maybe actually there is a future. <laughs> if I want to be a translator, I can actually make money and not have to, to poor for the rest of my life. Um, and through that I found blogs, there are a lot of different blogs um, on, on how to run a business, on how to become a better translator and, and all sorts of things. So I started reading that and then I joined ScotNet, which is the, the Scottish local organization within ITI. Then um, I 
so I'm going to events. So at the point I joined Scotland that they, their summer event was coming up. They have an annual big sort of weekend summer event and it was in Dumfries and I was told that I should definitely come along and rather than just go listen to talks and leave, I should stay for the whole weekend because then that's good for the networking. So I did. I was a bit scared because I didn't know anyone, but I got there and everyone was very friendly. The the here here he introduced me straight away at the beginning, so everyone knew I was new and they they come over and check how I was doing. So it was, it was a very warm, warm welcome. So that was that was a good start. And then um, I I got the the idea from there because there are people there who've done this for five years, ten years, twenty years even. So well maybe you know maybe it's actually quite a good good career for me even. So then that. That spring, I finally detached myself from my dad's company and set up my own. So now I trade as Lingua Nordica, which changed things for me as well because now I was in control of everything. I knew how much money there was. I knew how much work I needed to do to, to make enough money. I knew that if I wanted to do this course, I needed this much and everything. So I had a, an overview of what the situation was, which helped me because I'm a bit of a control freak. So it helped me a lot. Um, and then. I went there's a clinic in Scotland called Business Gateway who organised a lot of different courses for free. So I did a bookkeeping course which was really, really good. It was actually quite an interesting course. So that taught me how to how to deal with that side of my business. And then um, I started going to talks and doing webinars and courses. So this last autumn I've actually spent travelling around the country quite a lot. So I went to in September, I went to Ma Manchester where Julia Jenner came over from America to talk about getting direct clients. And then the, and Scotnet had um, a thing in October in Glasgow about social media. And then I went to Derby in November where Marcus Somashak and Valerie Ali Carter had, um, they had a course on marketing and, and business, the business side of translation. Um, and this again has given me a lot of new tools and, and ways to develop the actual business side of things. Um, I've also recently I've joined the Edinburgh Business Women's Club, I've joined the Edinburgh Chamber of Commerce, and also I've joined the British, Finnish and the Swedish Chambers of Commerce, they're in London, but I could go to events there as well. So I do get out of the house, I meet people both in the industry and in the business sort of sector, so I don't just have to sit on my own at home and not speak to anyone. So basically what happened was that I learned to get a business mindset, where there's a lot of translators, friends who are just graduated and they think, oh, I'm just a translator, I'm just here on my own and I'm, I'm just, just that, that's the word, just a translator, whereas what you need to do is, I'm a business owner, I'm running a business, so I learned that and that's really, really changed things for me. So looking back, things I wish I'd known, so I, I said I spoke to, to some friends about this as well, um, first of all, make sure you learn to use at least one capital. Um, I have a friend who told me that during her BA she never even saw a cat tool and that is, um, it, I know all programs don't sort of force them upon you but like in my case I have teachers who just use them in the courses but if you become a freelance translator it's likely not to be a single job you do that's not in a cat tool that, that you don't use a cat tool for, at least for me, if it's more than a couple of sentences I use something like Trados. and. If you know how to use one, it's quite easy to learn other ones because they're fairly similar. So at least you're not going to be the first day you start work, you open it up and you don't know what to do at all. So make use of your time at university for this. Then try to learn entrepreneurial skills. This is something, again, that's not usually included in translation courses, which is a shame as so many people end up being freelancers. But try to find out about this. You can do courses, you can read books, you can read blogs so that you know how to actually run a business when you get to that point. Um, and then, well, as you're probably going to be told, try to specialise. I didn't. Um, I'm still sort of doing fairly general work. I've, I've sort of taken the route of seeing where the work takes me. So I do a lot of public administration, education and um, business. So that's where the work is at the moment. But if you have anything you can specialise in, then try to do that because it, it does help. But again, don't worry too much. Don't have anything, you can just see what, what you like because that's another thing as well. You might think, like I did, I thought, okay, I want to do literature or something really creative, that's that's fun, I want to do that. And I don't understand people who do 
who want to do manuals because that's just really boring. And then I get this to work and I realize that I get a creative text. I'm like, oh, this is really fun. Five minutes in, I'm pulling my hair out. I was like, why am I doing this job? Because I just, I, I, I can't, can't, um, it's not really what I enjoy doing. Whereas if I get a manual, I know it's very sort of straightforward because there's a certain way of expression, expressing things. And I quite like that. So one of my favorite things to do is, um, is, um, press releases, because they're very straightforward, they're, they're factual, and it's very easy in that sense. So I've found that's what I enjoy, whereas like so you, you might find that what you think you're going to enjoy is actually not the case. So it's good to try different things. Then, um, looking to student memberships, I know both the ITI and, and the um, um, Chartered, in, Chartered Institute of Linguists, they both have student memberships. And this way you can start networking, you can meet your future colleagues, and um, it makes sense to try to meet both people with the same language combination as you because if they have too much work you might be lucky and they say hey I know this person you can try them but also people with other and the opposite language combination because for example I know someone in England who he does um, Finnish into English but he's, he's got quite a lot of clients who think oh but it works both ways so can you do this from English into Finnish and they says, no I can't but I know this person who does that so all these contacts can be useful, and then again for if you improve reading and things like that, and, and even just to, to find out about how to run the business, either you know, just any sort of combination doesn't really matter. You can just ask them about how to to get started and how to to market and things like that. And what's also important to learn, if you can, is about pricing, pricing, quality, invoicing, and things like that. Um, there's there's the problem of, of Students among others, but students who get started and think, well, I'm just, I'm just, I just started out, so I'll charge less because then I'll get work and then I'll, I'll work my well. Whereas that's once you set your prices, it's very, very hard to to raise them later. So just and then then the whole business, basically the whole area suffers because prices go down. So it would be good to look into this before you get started. It's hard to find information, but if you can, try to find out what the going rates are. Um, we had a course at my uni. It was a translation course, but the teacher had us write a quote before and say what we'd charge for it and then send an invoice after and everything, which is really good because then you sort of know what sort of things to add. Like he said, oh, you know, you should always add this, this quote is valid for however many days because otherwise the client can come back two weeks, weeks later and say, yeah, you'd do it by this date, so, you know, are you going to do it now when you only got two days left or something like that? So all sorts of things like that are really good to, to find out if you can while you're still studying. And then... This is something I know everyone can't get an internship, not everyone can afford an internship, but if you can, it can be a foot in the door and your first client if you go freelance, which is what happened to me, because they know you and if, if they think you're good, then they're quite happy to keep working with you, so that's definitely a good idea, if you can. And then why, why, why become a freelance translator as opposed to an in-house translator, in my point of view anyway. So there is the whole fact that you are in charge of of making money, but on the plus side, you've got the freedom. So you can choose what sort of text you want to work with, what subjects, what clients. You can choose your prices to some extent at least. You can choose what hours you work. You can, you can with holidays, well, you don't have to get someone to sign off your holidays. And you can work wherever you want. So like me, I just decided I want to live in Edinburgh, and now I do. And in the summer, some of them, oh, I've done four hours of work. That's enough for today. It's sunny. I'll go to the beach. So, you know, things like that, if, if um, I like catch up later, you can, you can be very flexible that way. And you can do it with the traveling, you can think, oh, I want to work from a beach in Bali for three months. As long as you've got internet, that's fine. Or live abroad if you want to live in your, the country where they speak your other languages, you can maybe do a tour of the world and just live in each country for a while. So that's definitely a plus. And this is something that everyone maybe thinks is a good thing, but I definitely do because you get to do, because you run your own business, you get to do the marketing, the networking, the learning, CPD, all the finances and everything. But then if you don't like something, for example, you can just get um, an accountant, you can outsource things as well. Because I like having lots of different things to do, I get bored quite quickly if I'm doing the same thing all day, so I'm quite happy with this side of it as well. And you have the chance of diversification which can either be related to translation or completely unrelated. So you can start, if you notice your clients need 
services in, in copywriting, you can offer that. Or, or if you know how to make websites, you can start offering that. And for example, I'd like to sort of move into freelance writing as well, which is quite easy to do in the sense that I'm already self-employed, so I don't have to quit a job and see if it works. I can try it on the side. And um, I've been contacted by Finnish companies saying, oh, we have a group coming to Scotland, would you come and do a tour? And because I love travelling, I love Scotland, and I do it for free, so I'm actually getting paid to do something I love, so I'm quite happy to do that as well. Um, so that's definitely a plus. And then you can make your own business decisions, which is, for example, with CPD and conferences. I go into a conference in Newcastle, but I have a friend who she works from home, but she's technically an in-house translator, and she'll either have to talk her boss into paying for it or pay for it herself. Whereas for me, it's a business expense. So with taxes and everything, it works out quite well in that sense. So you can make those decisions a lot easier if you're your own boss. And then uh, the resources that I mentioned. So the first book I read, like I said, was, was Chris Derby's book, The Prosperous Translator, and Judy and Dagmar Jenner's The Entrepreneurial Linguist. They're both really good when you're starting out. Um, and the blogs, like I mentioned, there's several. Uh, so Judy and Dagmar Jenner have a blog, and Tess Witty writes about marketing. So these, I actually haven't done those courses myself, but um, there's there's the ITI course that, that Sarah mentioned, and then Nicole Adams does an online course, A to Z of Freelance Translation, which you can do online in your, at your own pace. And then also, there's um, Marisa Lambert, she has the Business School for Translators, which is a blog and a book now and a course. So I did this course, it's a, a five week course about everything that you need to know about running a business, it's marketing, it's being in touch with direct clients, and being in touch with agencies and everything. So that's, that's really good. So you can start by looking into the blog, and if you like what you see, then read the book and maybe take the course. And then here's just my details. If you look. I'm actually having a new website made at the moment, so that's going to change, but it's going to But yeah, that's So now we're going to take some questions. Um, really you can develop, um, Jenny mentioned the internships, um, and the, there are a growing number of translation companies in the UK now, um, some, some ITI corporate members and um, some other translation companies that offer quite short internships, but these translation companies themselves realise that, that in order to succeed, in order, in order to beat the, sort of the big massive translation companies, they need to specialise as well. So when you go into a translation company, a small translation company like that, as an intern, you're getting exposure to clients in very niche areas and you can develop specialization quite quickly or, or learn 
really where to go to get the information to develop that specialization quite quickly. So that's maybe two initial um, questions that I know often come up. <laughs> The Rates and Salaries Survey is available for members of CIOL and members of ITI. Uh, and if you're not members, then I think it's um, you can buy it for about is it 20, 30 pounds, yeah. something like that. It's a, um, it was done in 2011, and so naturally we're now in uh, 2015, things have moved on slightly. Um, inflation isn't, hasn't been that high historically in the last three or four years, so uh, the prices haven't gone up that much. Um, but we're looking at repeating the exercise um, in the next 18 months as well. So um, by all means, have a look at the, the, color, the current um, results, but bear in mind that you know, things will have moved on slightly. Um, so you can get hold of that from the ICI website if you're an ICI member. Uh, we thought you asked about um, how the students can become members. And we have um, our student offering is, I think it's about 50 pounds. Yeah for the year, um, which obviously works out at less than, or just around a pound a week over, over the course of the year. So even though you, know, you might think that writing a cheque or uh, 50 pounds at one, at one go is, is, is a substantial investment, when you actually think about uh, over the course of the year, then it, it, does, it does work out quite economically. Quite well, we are actually a social member, mm -hmm. so do our students still need to... Yes. Yeah. Um, the, as an associate, um, the corporate associate, what you get is you get access to the bulletin, so the, the magazine that Sarah mentioned, that will get sent out to you. I think you can probably get a couple of copies, so that will go to the library and the students can see it there. Mm -hmm. But if the students wish to want to join ITI themselves, and then they can access the networking events, they can access the professional development, and mm -hmm. uh, they can come to the conference and the districts and join the other networks. Yeah, but basically, the, the um, the, all the benefit member benefits that are open to um, professional members as, are open to student members as well. Mm -hmm. um, apart from the, the the listing in the ICI directory, which is the sort of the, the, the main profile area for, through which you can sell your your services on the website, but students don't access that because we only give that to people who've actually de demonstrated their credentials really. Um, so, you, but. Once you become a student, then there's uh, you, know, so you get introduced to, to other members, and you start um, moving up through the you're on the the, the the career ladder, as it were, and then there's this fairly natural progression um, through different um, categories of membership to become a qualified member. And so, if you wanted to become a, a student member, if you were to go to the iti.org.uk, that's the, the the main website, and click on become a member. The instructions there. there is a, an online form you can fill out, uh, and you'll get a, a membership pack. Alternatively, if you wanted membership to request membership packs from um, ITI, we send them out, send a bunch out to you, okay. and you can distribute to your students. Yeah. I think we have time to take some more questions. <coughs> oh, uh, I'm next. I'm from Russia, so uh, surprisingly, I'm here. Um, uh, you mentioned about different backgrounds for translators. Um, I believe that to translate something well, you need to understand it well. Uh, but sometimes that's just not the case, right? Not, not just not always. Uh, um, what happened to me uh, if I didn't really understand something, um, I had to ask the client uh, to find a person within the company to help me understand. And sometimes there was a struggle uh, because people had their own work to do. Yes. So does this happen to you? Yeah. And I'm how do you work work out that struggle? Some clients get it. Some clients totally understand that the the translator needs to be an expert um, in order to translate. Um, some clients don't. Some clients just think, oh, you're just typing it up in a different language. So just change the letters. Just change the letters yeah. exactly. Um, and really, it's a case of finding the contact who the person who's responsible for the consequences of that translation going wrong. Yeah, and if you can find that, make, make contact with the person who's who's basically going to carry the can if it doesn't work out. Then it's very 
easy to convince them that they need to work with you to, to provide you with the information because they're the one who's going to have to deal with it in their company if, if the translation isn't, isn't right. Um, getting access, some companies, you know, it depends on the hierarchy on the, on the structure of the company. Sometimes you've got to go all the way to the top. Sometimes you might just strategy document. You might need to talk to chief executives or, or other C-level executives. And again, it's about making the case, explaining to your customer, look, this is the price of failure, if you like. 